senior faculty member, and uh, the faculty member said yes on one condition. And I went to another faculty member, and the faculty member said yes, but on one condition. Curiously, everybody I asked said yes, and it was always the same condition. And the condition was that they not speak after Marvin. <laughs> so I took that place. And uh, I couldn't find anybody else that would do it, and uh, you now know why. Uh, I also want to mention something I forgot in the introduction um, about Marvin because uh, of his humor and also because I was very much involved in, in raising the money to build the media laboratory. And one thing we never did when we built the media lab is we never raised enough money from a single individual to call it something, the something laboratory or the, you know, like the Salk Institute or the Sloan School or something. It's indeed in the Wiesner building, but it doesn't have a name. And Marvin asked me one day, he said, uh, how much would you charge somebody? Uh, to put their name on the laboratory. And I said, Marvin, that's very easy. We've already decided the answer is $30 million. And he said, well, that's interesting. Would you give them a discount if they were willing to change their last name to media? <laughs> so it's uh, indeed a, a hard person to follow. And uh, we are all delighted to have Marvin uh, as a member of the Media Laboratory. Uh, in putting together the, uh, the symposium, we tried to make the two days of lectures go, if you will, from general to much more specific. And tomorrow starts to get uh, much more technical and specific. Um, in some sense, uh, my presentation will be the first where we, we start to, to get uh, specific. And uh, it's, it's the shortest one. If you look at the, uh, the number of minutes that have been allocated to everybody, you'll notice that conspicuously I allocated to myself the smallest amount of minutes. And the reason uh, is twofold. Uh, one is I wrote most of the little booklet that you people have, and I'm just not about to sort of repeat its contents. And the other is that I very often, in fact, not, I shouldn't say often, almost all the time, act as spokesman of the, for the laboratory and run around the world giving lectures, talking about the work of all these other people. And so here I am left now talking about my own. And my own uh, is that, the slide went away, but uh, is that uh, provocative uh, title. And uh, as you will see, it really is a very, very simple subject. Maybe we could bring the title slide back uh, on the screen. What I'm not going to talk about is uh, sort of the, the, the magic that will happen. And when you, when you make a title like that, there are a lot of people in the media business that are sort of holding their breath and saying, my God, what is he going to say? And really, you know, is it goodbye to newspapers and so on? And when people see a title like that, they say, well, what he probably means is that we're going to have little devices that are computers and they look like paper and uh, they feel like paper and they're downloaded by fiber optics cables that have incredible bandwidth and uh, so on. Um, that's really not what I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about the magical terminals that will uh, in many years, not, sorry, not so many years, uh, give us the look and feel of some of the more old-fashioned media. And I'm also not going to talk about the delivery channel, whether it comes from the sky or whether it comes through fiber. Uh, as people in this room know much, much better than I, when fiber is brought to the home, you can get uh, 100 copies of the Wall Street Journal delivered to you in every second. And so you think to yourself, when I, what am I going to do with that? Uh, Wall Street Journal, by the way, 100 copies is about that high off the ground coming at you once per second uh, is a pretty incredible thought. But that is still, I don't think, the major change. Um, I'm not going to talk about the uh, devices in the sense of things like fax machines, clearly to run around shipping newspapers, usually using uh, children who are uh, under age to be working anyway, uh, and cutting down trees and doing all of those things. It's obviously 
much more reasonable to deliver it electronically, print it in the home, which will happen, uh, on large format paper, which will happen, on fax machines, which will use things that don't make you feel you're getting cancer on your fingers when you read it, and even reusable paper. I can imagine a few years from now uh, you will have your home newspaper printed in the home, and when you're finished, uh, you will throw it into the washing machine with your clothes, and it'll be cleaned and ready for the next day when it is reprinted. Uh, or maybe in developing countries, they could invent a way where you could eat it uh, or do something uh, constructive. And uh, again, these are not the big changes. Uh, what I would like to tell you very quickly is what I think the big changes are. And as you will see, um, there is, in fact, only one change. Uh, now, moving on to the slides. Um, so now I will, okay. Done. Uh, I'm going to go through um, a few slides that just review how we got started and again point out why I think that the real change isn't buried in these slides. This is an interesting situation that the Media Lab has existed for a certain number of years and we are probably going to change very much. Uh, I really don't want to organize a 10th birthday or anniversary or a 15th, but maybe on our 20th when you come back. Uh, we will have lots of, and I think it'll be very different. Uh, but at the time, in 1979, when we were sort of marketing the idea, we believed that sort of the sensory richness that you knew and, and still know in film and broadcast would sort of be intersected with the information content that one normally associates with books and print, and of course the interactive interactivity of computers. So you would take the richness of interactivity from the yellow world, the richness of information from the blue world, and the richness, if you will, of sensory apparatus from the red world, and they would come together. And in some sense, you can argue is this is how the world of multimedia was born. Now, um, maybe I have to hold these up. Okay, what I dreaded is happening. There we go. No. Let's. Um, at any rate, these slides are, oh, eight years old, seven or eight years old, and they illustrate that very diagram, namely, uh, when they were active, it was hard to tell whether that was print, whether that was television, obviously it was a computer, and I remember days when people would come to the laboratory and uh, they'd look at a screen like this, and then all of a sudden, one of the little quadrants would turn into live video, and they would gasp. I mean, people would go, you know, just couldn't believe that that still picture would come to life, and yet everybody takes it for granted today, and it is indeed the world of multimedia, and it is, in fact, uh, the, where we are moving very, very rapidly. The other kinds of work that, that went on, and this is about uh, two years ago, or three years ago, really had to do with trying to have computers do the reading, have the computers look at things. And I've taken these slides from Walter Bender, who's at the Media Laboratory, and they're quite, they're quite important because in there is the seed of the next step. And I will show you two more slides, which are old, uh, but again, describe the sort of work that went on at the Media Laboratory. Uh, in this case, four years ago, where people tried to build magazines, electronic magazines that would reflect the system's knowledge of the reader and not really rewrite the story, but at least integra integrate uh, certain bits of information about the reader so that the story was, if you will, uh, a little bit more meaningful. And more current work uses some very high definition display systems to try again and mix the, the, uh, the world of print and video. And in one case, we even went so far as to try and print personalized newspapers in hard copy. And uh, the truth is it didn't really work, but we did try. Now, what I want to, to get to is what is the actual key and what is really what's going to happen. This sort of diagram makes me a little bit self-conscious uh, because they're, they're not particularly amusing, but on the left is basically what happens when you broadcast 
in the mode of newspapers, books, and magazines. They're made and they're shipped to a human being, and uh, that human being uh, it absorbs them in one way or another. The fundamental change is the slide on the right, and that is the following, that in the future, most information will not be sent to people. It will be sent to machines. And the sad truth of this short presentation is that's, that's it. That's, that is really the fundamental difference. And the consequences of that are really quite enormous. Namely, when you start thinking of, of delivering books or newspapers or magazines, that in the future you are basically making information that will be destined to machines, not people. But then you say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, that doesn't really make much sense. We already do that uh, because we have machines, in the case of, of radio and television, um, that uh, uh, already decode things. So we are shipping to machines, and whether it's a television or a radio or a fax, there is a machine, but that machine is doing fundamentally nothing. It's decoding the signal in a way because it's come in uh, in this funny format that you can't quite absorb unless you're very special, and uh, uh, it turns it into uh, a picture in the case of television, uh, sound in the case of radio, and uh, an image in the case of fax. Um, as, a, as an aside, the explosion of the fax machine is, uh, is a wonderful phenomenon, but very few people pay attention to how deadly it is in the long term uh, if you really look at the computer readability of information. And if we had had this conference 10 years ago and predicted how much information is computer readable in the world, we would have predicted a steady growth into the year 2000 and then along came the facts, which has caused this great nosedive in computer readability and we have basically made more and more of our information not computer readable by sending faxes instead of electronic mail to each other, but we'll recover and the, the, it'll come back up again. There's another kind of, uh, of machine that, that, in fact, you'll hear about in the next presentation from uh, Andy Lippman, which uh, expands, uh, the signal comes in, and it's a little bit like instant coffee. You get this, this uh, uh, you know, jar of instant coffee and you put a teaspoon of it in and you pour a little hot water and it turns it into real coffee. Well, that's what those sorts of machines do. They get a little bit of signal and then they, so to speak, pour hot water and turn it into a, uh, an actual uh, image. Well, I don't consider either of those um, particularly uh, important to the future uh, by comparison to, to sort of a more general view of the, uh, of the world and that is uh, in these two slides. Whatever F is, I'm trying to look mathematical, so it's be in keeping with Marvin, um, whatever this function is in the box is, is a filter, okay? It does things on your behalf. Namely, it's, it's basically an agent or a society of agents that do things for you. And uh, basically, it's a matter of reading the newspapers for you and so on, and then what you're doing is having a conversation. Now you say, uh-oh, that's not going to work very well because I'm going to lose all the things that I run into serendipitously and so on. Well, that's not true at all. Uh, you won't lose that, and uh, I'll hope it'll become clear why uh, in, in a moment. The reason I've put two slides uh, here is that that one way to do this is in a central office, which uh, certain people in this audience uh, would advocate, um, and that is, uh, has its advantages, and the other way is to do it sort of in, in the home where you have the thickness is supposed to mean a very high bandwidth connection, and that filter sorts it out. So the, the hundred issues of the Wall Street Journal that come pouring into your house every second are filtered so that you, in the fact, wake up in the morning and get a manageable amount. Well, looking at the slide on the, on the right, uh, that can evolve in two ways. One way, which is, is going to take a while because the infrastructure has to be laid into the ground, is to put fibers and everybody gets this massive amount of bandwidth uh, delivered to the home and you pick out the little bit that you want. Uh, and the other one is where you deliver it, let's say, by satellite and again, you pick out uh, in your home 
what you want. Now, what are those boxes? Okay. So let's look at those boxes. The box is really sort of not only just looking at the world of information, but the error that people have made in thinking about this is that they don't realize it's this other thing, and L just stands for something as modest as life. Just what has your life been? What is your calendar about? What's, who are your friends? What are your habits? In other words, the image that people get very quickly is, oh my God, I'm going to have to type in to some machine or tell it I'm interested in the Red Sox, I'm interested in, in, in Bulldogs, I'm interested in the, uh, uh, the weather conditions in northern Italy, I'm interested in skiing conditions in such a, such a location. That's not the way it's going to happen at all. What's going to happen is, is that your entire life is going to be so computer readable in the sense that these processes and these computers are going to be interconnected that a lot of this machine is already, a lot of this sort of information is already going to be in existence. I mean, there are computers already that know my diary, know my travel plans. I mean, a plane ticket, if you came here, there's some computer that issued that ticket. Problem is that they're not talking to each other. They don't interact. They don't have a chance to build a model, if you will, the way an extraordinarily good secretary or friend or assistant or any other kind of uh, associate that really understands and shares with you um, a common space of work. And then there's the, set the other function, which is sort of you setting your own goals. I mean, it, you sort of either explicitly or implicitly um, establish really sort of what, you know, what are you trying to do? I mean, People, when we talk about personalized newspapers, say, oh, God, this is awful. I mean, what a terrible idea to have a personalized newspaper. You don't know what you're taking away from me. Um, well, I bet you really don't think that on Monday morning. On Monday morning, when you read the newspaper, perhaps at, say, 7 or 8 o'clock, you read it very differently than you do on Sunday afternoon. And the Monday morning style, if you will, is one where you really would start to accept this model much more rapidly because you say, yes, it really would survey the entire amount of information, and yes, it really would propel me, so to speak, through the day. Um, and the Sunday afternoon variety is a different goal. Your goal in reading that newspaper is very, or looking at that magazine, is, uh, is in fact very, very different. So let's, let's w what kind of humans uh, can we think about? Well, these are just sort of examples of, of people who already, uh, as humans, perform those sorts of functions. And that doesn't mean that you don't like driving a car if you have a chauffeur, or you don't like working the garden if you have a gardener, et cetera, et cetera. But it does mean that there uh, are conditions where the performance in those tasks isn't just based on knowledge of a subject, but is based very, very much on knowledge of you. Okay, and uh, the kinds of functions that those people perform, I've just listed um, a few of them, the kinds of functions that those, uh, those people, um, right now they are limited to people, perform are ones that, as I said, uh, really take a great deal of knowledge uh, about you. Now, what do they do? Well, I've just said it's made a sort of very limited list. Um, quite often they, they transcode things for you. I mean, imagine, uh, you know, you've, 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 you've gotten a letter in the office, and all of a sudden you have to rush out of the office, and you say to somebody, well, what did it say? Well, what's happening there is really extraordinarily important, because it's not only the summarization of what it said, but it's the moving it from the print to the, if you will, the acoustic domain. And uh, I can imagine in a few years for people who commute, if people still do commute, um, that racing out the door in the morning, your door might hand you an audio cassette uh, of all the interesting things it knows you didn't read or see in the newspaper so you can listen to them uh, on the way into work. And that's the kind of transcoding uh, that is certainly very, very possible. And needless to say, they telecommunicate and they know your whereabouts. The last one, though, is really quite important, and that is, is that, that they're distributed. It's not, it's not this kind of singular machine that is uh, in your house sitting on a desk or sitting in your car 
doing these things for you. And the next two slides are two very bad renditions of basically the same thought. Namely, one has to break away from the idea of thinking of computers on desks or on laptops, uh, that they go into pockets on wristwatches, and there's a whole sort of family of computing devices that intercommunicate, and what you don't get in one medium, or at least in one of these devices, gets transferred to the next, and you have, if you will, a certain computing presence uh, in this case illustrated in the hardware sense. I tried to put on the left the sort of numbers of hours. I don't know how many of you sleep with your wristwatch on, but uh, it's a personal thing, I guess. But uh, it could be up to 24 hours that you spend with that particular device. So it seems to me I'd put more computing effort and energy into that uh, than your uh, desktop, which most people spend uh, very little bit of time with unless that happens to be your profession. So there is a continuum which, curiously enough, most companies can't cope with because a company will have a computer division and then will have a telephone division and a wristwatch. So it says if you really tried to look at these sort of these I images horizontally, there is no company really in the world right now prepared to do that. Uh, and I think if somebody did it seriously, and really made a family of products that interconnected and so on, and, and really made a family and almost clipped together if necessary, um, you would have a very interesting uh, corporate strategy. Now, it says, well, this is okay, I can imagine it, but broadcast is a big, a big uh, side of everything. Um, let's, uh, let's look at this in the context of broadcast. But broadcast is, is really very interesting, and I'm picking broadcast and computers as is, is my two examples, and uh, uh, I'm doing that partly because of all the media, the first probably to, to go away, the first that will really suffer very seriously is network television. And I, I really believe that it's going to have extraordinary trouble over the next three or four years. Um, one of the reasons is illustrated uh, on the left, and that is that when television was invented, the assumption was, and perfectly good assumption at the time, is that you put all the intelligence in the transmitter and fundamentally nothing uh, in the receiver. It'd be filled with, as the slide says, which is a little silly, but it says air. Basically, it's just filled with nothing. Um, by comparison, in fact, to some of the more modern appliances in your home, I bet you most of you have televisions which on a per cubic foot basis are the dumbest appliances in your home. Uh, we really don't yet put very much computing uh, in the receiver and that's going to change dramatically. So that change is one of it. And the other change is, is illustrated on the right and I don't think anybody in the room will disagree with that slide on the right except for perhaps the number at the bottom. Uh, somebody will say, well, it isn't really 2010, it's 2020. But basically that which we get through the air today will get through the ground and that which we get through the ground will get through the air. Uh, there will be that trading of places. You already get cable television through the ground and you already have cellular telephones and that's just the beginning of, of the trend. Well, if you think of the intelligence in the receiver and then what it can do similar to what I was talking about before, you get home at night and now and your TV says to you, uh, Nicholas, uh, um, while, while you were away, I looked at uh, 355,000 hours of television this afternoon and uh, have this great 20 minutes that I have saved for you, which I think you would be really interested in seeing. And uh, uh, that is indeed uh, possible by building the sort of intelligence now into a television receiver. Uh, the next evolutionary step in television, some people think, is high definition, which is, a lot, which is rubbish. That is, that is, that is silly. Uh, and I'm sure uh, the next speaker will get into that, but if you walk down the street and you ask somebody what's wrong with television, you're not going to find anybody that says resolution. Uh, the, the, uh, w what's wrong with television is, uh, is, is, is programming. Uh, Andy Lippman, I hope I didn't steal a line of yours, but uh, uh, it's, it's clearly not an issue of, of resolution. Some people say, well, it's really important because it's, there's, you know, there's a, 
the axis has quality, if you will, is, is, which I don't believe is, is the predominant one. I think it's intelligence. Uh, but other people say it's really an economic uh, issue and that we have to, as a, as a nation, um, you know, really worry about uh, the, tr the threat from Japan, and I say this with a lot of Japanese friends in the room, and uh, that we really have to work on the, on the economic problem and uh, uh, that there's a lot at stake. And uh, I'd like to, to, without trying to be an economist uh, in any way, uh, is point out to you that I have attended two meetings, one in California, one in Florida, uh, last year, both devoted to the national economic impact of high-definition television and other uh, uh, evolutions, but primarily HDTV, uh, and the impact it would have on the United States and what the United States should take as action. And you won't believe this, but I promise you it's true. At both of these meetings, they served Evian water. Now, we can't even produce water, apparently. So I just think that the issue of economics is, is really quite a complicated one. And when Zenith builds its TV sets in Mexico and Sony builds them in San Diego, it's unclear to me, quite frankly, who's doing what to whom and which is best. And so uh, I will stick to the intelligence and not the economics. And the next slide, take with a little bit of uh, a little grain of salt because what, what's happening is, and the next speaker will talk more about it, is in the work of using that intelligence just to compress video. Just now we're using the intelligence not so much to filter it, but to compress it. Uh, you will be able to transmit uh, a one hour of video in five seconds, and in that environment now your TV set can sort of pick off what it needs. Uh, Stuart Brand, who wrote the book, uh, called the lab, uh, invented the term broadcatching, and to my extraordinary surprise, when I was talking to him about a year ago, I realized that he never saw the double meaning in that word, which is, I find, constantly very embarrassing. But uh, it is indeed uh, a way of viewing. The, I'm sorry, he, miss, he literally says he, he never saw it, and I've always had trouble with it. Um, the, notion of now sending video which isn't a sequential sequence but allows you to deal with so what we call tell me more so as Dan Rather is telling you what happened in Iraq today and if you're interested you push the tell me more button and he says oh well and he sort of elaborates all of that is real possible and real soon and we have put these two slides up periodically and as I said you shouldn't take it too seriously but it does have to do with what's going to happen. I showed this slide to, uh, actually I, I guess it's not, it's not wrong to uh, uh, mention names here. I showed this slide to uh, Mr. Wasserman, who's chairman of uh, MCA, a uh, busy man these days. Uh, I showed him this slide and he, uh, he looked at that and he said, he said, oh God, son, I love it when people call me son, uh, I think, he says, son, you realize that if the violence knob is turned down, the equalizer will only last one minute. <laughs> and I said, uh, said, said yes, sir. Uh, you understood thoroughly. <laughs> I want to end with just uh, five images of where sort of, again, this view of the machine as your agent and intermediary will change not just newspapers and broadcast, but will change our view of computing. I think that the computer manufacturers today, all of our friends included, really have this view that's illustrated on the slide on the right. They really believe that computers are built for desktops. And uh, uh, that metaphor came from the slide on the right and work, which I'm embarrassed to say is almost 18 years old, that we did uh, and it doesn't matter, the, I put that slide in upside down, it makes no difference. It's a little desktop metaphor that comes from many years ago and we thought that we were really right. We had, we, we had the solution. We knew that people would be able to deal with desktops uh, because they were familiar objects and we were very good at dealing with things spatially. 
We could sort of remember what was to the right of what and to the left and so on and so forth. And those of you in this room who have large collections of books, for example, you probably remember where the books are on the shelf. You can probably even remember the color of the spine and how wide it is and so on. Part of that comes from so-called motor memory reinforcement. You stood there on your tippy toes sort of putting this book on the shelf and your fingers were together this far and, and, and that sort of helps, if you will, in the motor memory reinforcement theory. Um, and today the kind of uh, evolution this has uh, is one that you see all over the place. I just picked these slides. Uh, this is the classic uh, display and uh, is, is the one that is now uh, not only being copied but people are even suing each other over it uh, and it's the idea that, that you make everything look like a desk. Um, I think that this is one of the most short-lived solutions and will really evaporate. Um, and it'll evaporate so soon that it might even evaporate before the law case is over. Uh, the reason is the following, that this metaphor goes very back to, to sort of the original remarks I was making. It assumes you want to use a computer. And most people don't, including you, most of the people in this room, including me. And I spend hours, as my family can attest, in front of a terminal. The reason you use a computer is because you can't delegate most of the things. So you have to directly manipulate this, this machine and get it to do things for you. If you come into my office, and I might embarrass some people in the room, but if you come into my office and ask me for uh, a letter that somebody wrote to me about uh, this con, I don't turn around and mouse around the screen and open a file folder called Media Lab Anniversary and then open up company names and then open up correspondence and go through it and up on the screen pops this letter. I mean, that's silly. I just push one button that turns a telephone into an intercom and blast into the next room. Can you please bring in the most recent letter from And it comes in a few seconds. Now, <laughs> the reason that works, and you can say this is a terrible, you know, this is a terrible thing to do to another human being whom you're interrupting and so on, and it is. It's awful, but it works. And it works extraordinarily well, and in the future when you push that button, you won't be getting a human, you'll be talk you'll be delegating difference is truly the notion of delegation and speech will play a phenomenal role and tomorrow you'll hear some extraordinary results in speech research from Chris Schmant. Um, I think it'll be the dominant mode of communication with machines for a number of reasons. Some were talked about in the book. Uh, it really lends itself to delegation. So what is the metaphor? Well, the metaphor isn't desktops. The metaphor is in fact, probably, and I can't find a good slide, and if somebody in the room wants to do me a real big favor, you can find a slide that sort of illustrates delegation. Maybe it's a sergeant pointing out to the different privates what they have to go and do, and somebody peels the potatoes, the other one cleans the latrines, and another one does this, and you sort of delegate it. But the notion of delegation is so fundamental to the future of computing, and is really quite ignored in, in most of the sort of human computer interface work and that that your screen today and these slides are a bit silly but this uh, I'm ending in a few seconds uh, the sort of this is the metaphor we have today whether it's to read a new personalized newspaper to look at television or sort of video windows in the future and that 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 really the direction we're heading is much more to sort of a theatrical metaphor and uh, uh, after you hear Steve Benton uh, tomorrow about holography. Uh, the kind of image that I have in my head uh, is that when I come into the office uh, in the year 2000, if there is an office, uh, is really one where these, these little sort of holographic people are walking across my desk waiting for me to get there and then I delegate to them sort of various tasks and that that is really the direction we'll be going uh, in computers over the next few years. At any rate, now introduce myself and take back the uh, podium as, as, as your host for the day, and that is invite you.